in this unit, yesterday we talked a little bit about uh, light as a wave dealing with wavelength and frequency and the electromagnetic spectrum, or basically the spectrum of different forms of light. And in this unit, we're really going to be concerned with looking at how light interacts with objects. And there's three different possibilities when light encounters something. When we do draw light, even though it is a wave, we're not going to draw it as a squiggly line. We're just going to draw it as a ray, almost like you would use in geometry class, a ray, just a straight line with an arrow to show the direction it's going. So there, if you have an object here, so this is some object, there's really three different possibilities of what could happen to light. The first thing that could happen is when light hits an object, it could be absorbed. That energy that makes up light could just be absorbed and that energy would be taken in by that object. That's something we'll actually talk about in our very last unit. So that's one possible thing. A second possible thing, light could hit the object and bounce off of it. So it could be reflected. That's something we'll look at in a lot more detail tomorrow. The third possibility, is that light could pass through an object. And in that case, we could say it's transmitted or it passes through an object. So a little bit what we're going to talk about today. And we're eventually going to talk about lenses next week and pick up a little bit more with that. So we're really focusing about what happens to light when it passes through an object or when it's transmitted. And some weird things happen. We perceive some weird things when light actually passes through an object. And that's for a couple of reasons. So when light passes through an object, a couple of things happen. But if you've ever looked at light when it travels through a different medium or a different substance, like for example, water, you may notice some distortion. Some distortion to what you're seeing in that object. And that's something called refraction. So when light travels through different mediums, there's a couple of changes that happen, and this may result in bending of light. We'll kind of go through that process, look at it conceptually, and then look at it from a mathematical standpoint as well. So this is the process we're going to be talking about today. Now, to step back from that for a moment, Starting from light moving in a vacuum or air, the speed of light we mentioned yesterday is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That speed does change with temperature. So if it's hotter, light will actually travel a bit faster. If it's colder, It may travel a little bit slower. Not enough for us to really perceive it. That actually happens a little bit more with sound, which we won't have a really chance to discuss that. It's more of an AP physics one concept. But in terms of like just one little wrinkle is that in a certain medium, it could possibly change speed due to temperature. So hotter, faster, colder, slower. But again, not super perceptible to our eyes. Okay. 
Now, when light does change into a different medium, when it passes from one medium to another, its speed does change. So this is really in light, I'm sorry, in air or in a vacuum, that's really the faster, that's really the fastest it will So three times 10 to the eighth meters per second is the fastest that light will move. And in different mediums, it'll actually slow down. So in different mediums, it'll go slower and slower. The more solid a medium, or I should say the more dense a medium, the slower it'll move. And there's a quantity called the index of refraction that is a measure of a material or a comparison of the speed of light Speed of light in air or that constant to the speed in that medium. So the index of refraction is a comparison between the speed of light in air to the speed of light in a certain medium. So, for example, Something like water has an index of about 1.33. The higher the N, the slower light moves. So Different mediums, actually, I should say different substances have a specific end value. So, water is always, or I should say, fresh water is always a 1.33. Different forms of plastic have different indexes. Different oils have their own index as well. But again, the higher the index, the slower it moves. And realize the lowest n value is one because nothing can really travel. I should say light never travels faster than three times 10 to the eight. But I want to say nothing can travel faster than the speed of light because um, I can't perceive everything in the world. And there's certain time travelers like the flash who can travel through time and change the past and the future. So I don't want to get in trouble with the flash. All right. And you got that. So just to practice that index of refraction calculation. So again, the formula looks like this, where the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And different materials have their own index of refraction. So zircon is an artificial diamond. And if you're wondering if something is a diamond or not, jewelers can actually do refraction tests to determine what the material is. So if they compare the speed of light, and actually what they do, we'll look at um, how light bends and talk about how they can actually calculate the index of something, not necessarily based on how fast light is moving, but how much it bends. Could you take a moment and try to solve for the speed of light in zero? You're going to get a pretty big number because, again, even though it's slower than three times 10 to the eight meters per second, light's still pretty fast. So to get that velocity, realize you're going to take the speed of light constant times that index. Now, the index of refraction, one thing I should note, there's no actual unit for it because it's really just a comparison of speed to speed or meters per second to meters per second.
And again, you can run Starberry light. Kind of centered around a couple of numbers here, depending on how you rounded it. But I got all right, so one, two, three, one, two, three. So six, so about 1.56 times 10 to the eight meters per second, roughly. So again, about half the speed of light in air. Now, one other thing. Before I bring up the next simulation, I forgot to put this in your slides. So I'm sorry about that. But one thing you'll see, notice actually, one thing you'll see in the next little simulation when light moves into a different medium, the speed changes and the wavelength changes, but not the frequency. So the frequency remains constant. So you may have a decrease in wavelength and a decrease in velocity, but the frequency of light is going to stay the same. So the actual form of light isn't going to change. So it's not necessarily going to change color or change the type of light. It's just traveling at a different speed. This is more like something that may come up as a multiple choice question or like what actually changes when light enters a new medium. But this simulation, we're going to look at several different times. There's several different aspects we are going to look at today. And I'll show you a couple of different things. And again, feel free to play around with it. I would say it's not a bad idea to open it up in a new tab. Just because then you won't be limited to that small part of the stair deck window. So there's a couple of different parts to this simulation. So the intro is not really that useful because we have the more tools section. Near the end, we'll look at the prism section and Look at some more pretty colors of light and stuff like that. But just to get the basics here. So what you have here is a little laser light. And I'm going to start with it perfectly vertical. And this red button is to turn it on and off. So not much interesting going on there. We'll eventually talk about what happens when you shoot it at different angles. But I just want to focus right now when you shoot it straight down. And it talks about on the side here the different materials you have it in. So, air on the right hand side has an index of one, glass right now has an index of 1.5. Now, right now in the upper left, you're looking at as light as a ray. But if you click on wave there, you'll see it as more of a waveform. Where there's a distinct uh, between two lines, you'll basically see what's essentially a wavelength. And when the light enters a new medium, you'll see a change in that light there. So when light actually moves into a new medium, there is a change that goes on there. And you can measure that change if you actually bring out this speed measure. So start saying one times here, one times three times 10 to the eight. And if we bring it into the other medium, you'll see that the speed decreases dramatically. And if you play around with the index of what it's going in, if it's just air into air, nothing changes. But as you increase the index, you see as we see the speed decrease. And as the speed decreases, we kind of see this wavelengths or these waves kind of pile on top of each other. So 
So the length or the distance of the wave gets compressed. So as the velocity is decreasing, the length or the length of the wave is decreasing as well. So that's just a visual of what's happening in terms of wavelength and speed. Now, what we're more concerned with is what happens when we have light going as we're going. So when we bring this at an angle, when the light hits that interface between the two medium, it's traveling along. Now, some of this light, you can see it bounces back and is reflected. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But there's another amount of light that goes through and realize it doesn't go straight through. If this was just air, it would basically go straight through without any change at all. But as it moves into a different medium, that light actually bends. The higher the index of refraction, the more that light is being bent. Essentially what's happening, and it might not show up very clearly at home, but if you think about this wave that's coming in, when it eventually hits that boundary, so this end here of the wave slows first, and the rest of it doesn't slow down until it hits that actual front. So it's almost like if I was walking along and uh, let's just pretend there's a cord here. So if I'm walking along and all of a sudden I hit something and I go, whoa, I fall down like that. I get tripped and actually fall over. So I bend. So that's what's happening when light is entering that medium at an angle. When it was coming in straight, it all slowed down at once. The whole wave hit that boundary at the same time. So there was no tripping, no bending at all. It's when you have it at that angle that it actually bends. So the part that's getting reflected is not bent. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But that rest of the light, if we look at it as a ray, it's being bent. So let me kind of clear this screen. And just to double check that, I'm going to pull out this protractor just so we can kind of compare the angle to. And these angles are being measured. In comparison to this normal or this perpendicular to the surface. So there's two angles here. This incoming angle, it's called the angle of incidence because it's incident on the material, or if you think about in any fight, there's some inciting incidents. The incident happens first. And then this other angle here that we're measuring down below is the angle of refraction. So when we're measuring the amount that light is being bent, or the angle it's coming in at, we always measure in relation to a normal or a perpendicular line. So you can see there's a dramatic difference in the angle of incidence to the angle of refraction when it's measured. Now there's a formula that actually relates those two. So I'm going to jump back to the pair deck for a moment. So again, these angles here, oops, let me turn on. This is the angle of incidence. This is the angle of refraction. So 
there's a relationship or a law that basically compares a couple of different factors. And it's called the law of refraction or sometimes called Snell's law. And what it compares is it compares the initial index. So for example, the medium you start out with times the sine of the angle of incidence. So think about this first side. It's the incident side. And this other side is the refraction side. So N2 would be the second medium. And this is the second angle. Now, it actually doesn't matter which one you call incidence and which one you call refraction, as long as you pair the angle with the medium it's in. And again, the other thing about the angle is always being measured from this normal, which is perpendicular to the surface. So this is really going to be the big formula of the day and the one main formula with refraction. So we're going to work through a couple of examples. The other thing to make sure, if you're in a calculator, you want to make sure you're in degree mode, not radian mode. Because if you use radian mode, it's going to throw things off because we're working with angles and degrees. All right, so let's go through a couple of examples. I won't go through all these just in the interest of time because I think you guys have pretty good math skills as I've seen. So I'll kind of set up the situation here. I want you to find the index of refraction of medium two, um, assuming medium one is air and given the incident angle of 30 degrees and the angle of refraction is 20 feet. So let me explain what it's saying. So this is the normal line. That's a pretty crappy normal line. Not letting me do dots very well. So this up here is air. So it has an index of one. And it said the angle of incidence. And I'm not going to do such a good job of drawing these angles. So you just have to bear with me. No way, no way that's even close to 30. And then the angle in the medium, it says is 22 degrees. And it wants you to find the index of that medium. So again, it doesn't matter which one you call one and which one you call two. The key thing is that you keep these together, keep the angle and the index together. So if we were going to set this first one up, it starts in air, so that's one. The first angle is 30. We don't know what that second index is. But we know this other angle is 22. So one times anything is just one. That's the nice thing about air. So you're left with this. And then to get the index, just to isolate that N, you want to set up like that. So do a little bit of math and try to find that index. And realize the index should be greater than one. These indexes are not going to be huge numbers, but it should be greater than one. So just to make sure you're doing it right, you may want to close the parentheses around your angles. Just to make sure it doesn't do like sine 30 divided by sine of 22, depending on um, how are you setting this up? Yeah. 
Do you get a number less than one? You may want to flip your division or divide the opposite way. So those who got about 1.33 or 1.35 or 1.3347, that is excellent. All right. So you can do this. This is really the major calculation that we're looking at. Um, you can do something just a little bit different because when you're solving for the angle, the problem gets slightly different. I mean, not that much different. You're still using the same equation. So suppose a situation where light goes from air. So air has an index of one, and it's going into a diamond, which has a much higher index of refraction. So it's going to move a lot slower, 2.4. And the incident angle is 30 degrees again. But we're trying to figure out this other angle here. So again, to kind of set it up for you. Air is one. That first angle is 30. The index of a diamond is 2.4. And this other angle is what we don't know. So work through. Eventually, you're going to have to do um, arc sign or inverse sign, whatever you like to call it, to actually get the angle. So if you're getting a number that's less than one, check your work again. And again, make sure you are in degree mode. These are looking very, very good. So, turn to the final answer that I'm seeing you guys get again. You get to this point here. Remember, you're going to have to do um, to get the actual angle. You're going to have to do arc sign or inverse sign of whatever you get there. And when you do that, you guys got about 12 degrees. Um, I realize my writing's kind of clear, clogging it up. But about 12 degrees at that angle it's being bent at. Now, this next one here we kind of already talked about, so I'm not going to ask you guys again. But again, the index of refraction is always greater than or equal to one because nothing really travels. Let's just say light never travels faster than. The speed of light in air or that. The next slide here, it's not a problem I want to solve. I just want to point something out in this image here. So, how light bends. So, again, don't worry about solving this. We're not going to solve it. I just like this image because it illustrates how we see things when we're in air looking underwater or underwater looking in air. So if you are actually staring at someone, so you're on the side of a pool, to your eye, it looks like someone is right there. But what's actually happening is the light from the water 
was bent. So in actuality, when you see something in water, it's actually deeper than it appears to your eyes. Because when the light comes out, it is being bent. Same thing for someone in the water looking out. You're actually going to look a lot further away than you really are. So the idea of light being bent changes depending on where you're looking at. So when light, a general kind of rule here. Um, let me kind of write this here. So if n1 is greater than n2, when light goes from here to here, two things happen. When light goes from a high index to a low index, it slows down. And the other thing we say it does, it bends towards the normal the normal line. So when we're talking about the way light bends, we don't really say up or down. We say whether it's bending towards or away from the normal. So when light slows down, it bends towards the normal. When it speeds up, it bends away from the normal. So again, when it was traveling from, when it was going this way, it bends away. When it goes down into the water, it's bending towards the normal. So again, without doing any math, that's just a general trend that we see. Now there are certain cases when light is in a medium and it doesn't actually leave that medium. So this turtle here, looking at the turtle's back here, the fact that you can actually see the back completely reflected on the water, you can't see what's outside of the water, is something called internal reflection. Where the light is being bent so much that it doesn't actually escape that medium. The perception, the angle you're looking at, light gets bent so much that it bends right back into the medium. And that's something called internal reflection. And I'm going to show you kind of show you that in the simulation, how we can kind of illustrate that. Now, one thing that has to happen. So I'm in the more tools section. And I'm going to reset everything. Now, this only happens if you're going from a high index to a low index. So I'm going to change this top one to water, this bottom one to air. So let's say you are underwater and basically right now you have an angle of zero. Now, if you look at the light, it's being bent away from the normal and it gets to a certain point where the light is bent so much that it just comes right back in. So yes, some of it is escaping, but at a certain point, it gets bent so much, or refracted so much, that it doesn't actually escape the medium. And again, this only happens if it's moving from, actually, all right, just like, if it's moving from a high, index to a low index. So it'll never happen with light going from air to water. It only happens in the opposite direction. Now, this point where it actually happens, so it gets bent more and more and more. So again, it's being bent as it goes from a high index to a low index, it's bending away from the normal until it reaches something called the critical angle. At that critical angle, it is bent 90 degrees. So it's perfectly parallel to the surface. 
So if you were up here in the first picture, you could see it, but there's nowhere out here where you could actually see that light. And in this third place here, it's being reflected perfectly back off of that surface of the water. So if you were up here trying to see it at that angle, you wouldn't be able to see it at all. So again, internal reflection is basically where light is reflected back into the surface. It's that so much that it can't escape that we. Now, in terms of the calculation for this, so in terms of the calculation for this, it's still using Snell's law or that law of reflection. But what we're saying is this critical angle at that critical angle. This angle is 90 degrees. So the sine of 90 degrees is just one. So we can remove that from the equation. And again, the other important thing here, we have to be moving from a high index to a low index. I just want to try one of these with that, and then we're going to look at one other phenomenon that's not really going to be mathematical at all. So someone wants to know what's the critical angle for light traveling in polystyrene, a form of plastic surrounded by air. So we want this light in polystyrene not to be able to escape into the air. It's going to be trapped inside that material. So again, that formula looks like that. Or again, you could say this as well. But again, we are looking for what that critical angle is. And air has an index of one. We're trying to solve for that critical angle. If we're going from polystyrene, the light is starting in that plastic and it's not able to escape. What's the angle at which it won't be able to escape? Second medium is air. So that's one. One point four nine. Give me a second again. Make sure you're in degree mode. So all you got around an angle of 42 degrees. So that is perfect. That means anything above 42 degrees, um, light would not escape. 
And at 42, it's making that perfect 90 degree angle with the surface. Now the last, this is actually an offshoot of diffraction. This concept called dispersion, where you take white light and it gets bent to a point where the different colors of the visible spectrum actually split up. Now, um, on Friday, for those who are in person, we'll do a little bit of that in the lab we're doing, but to kind of play around this a little bit virtually, in that same simulation, it's um, clear. There's a section called prism. So head to that section. I'm going to reset it. Now, there is this a boring version of this where on the side here, it just has this red light, single red light. And if you shine it, it's like, ooh, bendy. And you can change the wavelength of light if you want to make different colors. Or you could do, ooh, multiple. <laughs> but the last option there, is going to shine white light. And what you'll see is that when you shine that white light, it gets bent at those multiple interfaces. And what's happening is it's getting bent so much. Different frequencies actually bend at a slightly different angle. And just to show you that, I'm going to go back over here and um, let's see if I can do this. Let me change this to air and this to water. Actually, I'm going to change it from water to something else. I'm going to go really high index here. And as I change the color, as I change the color, if you look really closely at the angle, let me go to a really high angle here. The angle will change slightly. So this one actually starts at about 35 for the um, refracted angle. But it's actually going to bend less. So the higher the frequency, or we could say the shorter the wavelength, it's actually going to bend less. And that's kind of the science of why we have that dispersion happen. Different wavelengths of light or different frequencies of light get bent at different angles. So in this prism, when you have a higher index, so if I just have this as air, it goes straight through. As I change the index of what we're looking at, it's going to get bent more and more. And the higher the index, the more separation we have in terms of the colors. So while you can create a rainbow, shining white light through water, you'll get much better separation if you use a high density glass or a high index glass or a diamond. The higher the index, the more separation or dispersion you will get. Now, um, I'll come back here and show you some other pretty things in just a little bit. Because you can really play around and have some fun with that. But the last little concept to kind of talk about is the idea of rainbows. And rainbows, you have a couple of different light phenomena happening. So what happens is sunlight enters a water droplet at an angle. And what you have going on here, So you have some refraction happening when the light enters, but also you have dispersion. So light actually, because of that index, it actually starts, some of that light starts spurning out at different places. Now at the back of that raindrop, there's internal reflection. 
So the light actually doesn't escape that raindrop. It gets reflected back out the other end. And then when it exits, we have even more refraction and dispersion. So when we say dispersion, it's really another way of saying refraction, but to a point we were saying that the light waves, the visible light is split up into its different colors. It's bent enough to separate it out into the different colors. So that's what's actually happening inside a single raindrop. So when you have multiple raindrops, that light from those individual raindrops are actually what's creating that rainbow. So you're not seeing all the colors from a single raindrop. Each raindrop is giving you a different color of the rainbow. So you have rain all along the spectrum here. And each one, depending on the viewing angle, is giving you a different color of that rainbow. Now, in order to see a rainbow, what's really important, the sun has to be behind you. So if you ever see a sunny sky and it's raining off in the distance, you have your back to the sun and you look towards the storm, that's the way you'll see the rainbow. Not if you're looking at the sun, if you're looking away from the sun, because the light comes from the sun into the raindrops and comes back to your eye. Last little thing. And this will pop up a little simulation on your computer, just so you can kind of see. In reality, and I actually want to bring this up here. In reality, rainbows are actually circles. The only problem is when we are looking at a rainbow, the horizon actually cuts out the rest of the rainbow. So if you're actually in an airplane and you have the sun to your back and you're looking to storm clouds, that's the time you can actually see the whole circle of the rainbow. Now, you may have heard people talking about or seeing double rainbows. And when you see a double rainbow, it's just a matter of you seeing a whole nother rainbow at a different angle. So that double rainbow is just that the light, or I should say <coughs> the sun is strong enough to shine enough light. So you see a whole nother bow above it. So there has to be enough sunlight with enough intensity to shine on that second set of raindrops for you to actually see a rainbow. So there's no math with rainbows really at all. There is a perfect viewing angle, but we won't really worry about that. That's not really something that you're going to be tested on. It's just a wonderful light trick. Now, going back to this simulation here, um, Again, this is nothing mathematical, nothing that you'll ever be tested on, but I don't know. It's always fun to play with this and see if you can do pretty things. Like, ooh, pretty light. All right, so you can turn on a couple of things like the refractions, reflections, not so much that, but again, this is just something you can play around with if you get bored and stuff like that. So I will leave it there. There are a couple of questions on Canvas, and these are from the AP, just to give you a sense of the type of questions they're going to ask. These won't be due until sometime next week, but you can just maybe like 12 questions, multiple choice that you could try out. We've got about half an hour. If you want to hammer those out today, or if you have something really important that you have to do with homework. That is fine too. If you just want to play around with this simulation, please feel free to. So, tomorrow we'll talk about reflections and mirrors. And then there'll probably be, uh, actually, I don't think there's another problem set tomorrow. There might be one next week. All right. So, you can go ahead and play around if you want, or just relax. But the rest of the time, there's the questions. Please ask.
Again, these problems are just for completion, not about how many get correct. 